Welcome everyone. This is GL Supplemental Review. Today, we will be discussing 25 items of general education questions in preparation for September 2023 board exam for teachers. Dear Divine Father, I come before you today with a humble heart, seeking your guidance and blessings as I embark on my review. I recognize that knowledge and wisdom are gifts that can unlock doors and empower me in my journey. Grant me the clarity of mind to absorb information, to understand concepts, and to retain knowledge effortlessly. Fill my heart with curiosity and the thirst for learning, so that I may approach my review with enthusiasm and a hunger for understanding. Open my eyes to new perspectives and ideas, allowing me to see connections and patterns that were once hidden. Illuminate my path with insights and revelations that will help me grasp complex subjects and solve intricate problems. I ask for your presence and support throughout this review, to be a guiding light in moments of confusion or doubt. Grant me the strength to persevere when the material seems overwhelming and the patience to take breaks and rest when needed. May my review be fruitful, and may the knowledge and wisdom I acquire empower me to excel in my endeavors. Help me to apply what I learn with wisdom, discernment, and compassion, so that I may make a positive impact in the world. I trust in your infinite wisdom and know that with your guidance, I can overcome any challenge and achieve success. I am grateful for the opportunities before me and for your unwavering support. In your name, I pray. Amen. Here are some tips on how to review effectively. Plan and organize. Create a study schedule or plan to allocate specific time for review. Break down the material into smaller, manageable chunks, and prioritize areas that require more attention. Summarize and condense. As you review each topic, condense the information into concise summaries or outlines. This process helps reinforce your understanding and makes it easier to recall key points later. Use active learning techniques. Instead of passively reading or reviewing notes, engage in active learning techniques. This can include explaining concepts to yourself or others, creating flashcards for quick recall, or solving practice problems. Practice retrieval. Test your knowledge and understanding by actively retrieving information from memory. This can involve using flashcards, taking practice quizzes, or explaining concepts without referring to your notes. Retrieval practice enhances long-term retention and helps identify areas that require further review. Seek clarification. If you come across any confusing or unclear concepts during your review, don't hesitate to seek clarification. Consult your textbooks, online resources, or ask a teacher or classmates for assistance. Understanding the material thoroughly is crucial for effective review. Connect and relate. Look for connections and relationships between different concepts or topics. Relating new information to previously learned material helps reinforce understanding and promotes a deeper level of learning. Review actively and regularly. Instead of cramming all the review into one session, spread it out over multiple sessions. Regular and consistent review enhances retention and reduces the likelihood of forgetting in form. Take breaks and rest. While reviewing is important, it's equally crucial to take breaks and give your mind time to rest. Breaks help prevent mental fatigue and enhance overall focus and productivity. Teach others. One of the most effective ways to solidify your understanding is to teach others. Explain concepts to a friend or family member, or imagine yourself teaching a concept to someone else. Teaching forces you to articulate your knowledge and identify any gaps in understanding. Reflect and self-assess. Periodically reflect on your progress and self-assess your understanding. Identify areas where you feel confident and areas that need further review. Adjust your study plan accordingly to focus on weaker areas. Question number one. The type of soil that contains a mixture of sand, silt, clay and humus is blank. A. Lime. B. Heat. C. Subsoil. D. Loam.
the type of soil that contains a mixture of sand, silt, clay and humus is blank. For question number one, the correct answer is D. Loam. Loam is a type of soil that contains a balanced mixture of sand, silt, clay, and organic matter such as humus. It is often considered the ideal soil type for gardening and agriculture because it has good drainage, retains moisture well, and provides a suitable environment for plant roots to grow and thrive. Peat is a type of soil characterized by the accumulation of partially decayed organic matter. It is often found in wetland areas and has a high water content. Subsoil refers to the layer of soil beneath the topsoil and can vary in composition but is not specifically associated with a mixture of sand, silt, clay, and humus. Clay Clay soil has a high percentage of fine particles. It is characterized by its stickiness and ability to hold water for extended periods. Clay soils can be dense and heavy, making it difficult for water to drain through them properly. They tend to be fertile but may require amendments for better drainage. Sandy Sandy soil is composed of larger particles and feels gritty to the touch. It has good drainage but does not retain water well. Sandy soils tend to dry out quickly and may require frequent irrigation. They are often less fertile and struggle to hold nutrients, requiring regular additions of organic matter and fertilizers. Silty Silty soil contains medium-sized particles that are smaller than sand but larger than clay. It has a smooth texture and is often fertile due to its ability to retain moisture and nutrients. Silty soils are well-draining and can be easily worked, but they can become compacted and may require organic amendments for improved structure. Chalky Chalky soil is characterized by a high proportion of calcium carbonate or limestone fragments. It is alkaline in nature and tends to be shallow and stony. Chalky soils drain well but can be drought prone. They often have low organic matter and may require additions of compost or organic materials to improve fertility and water retention. While, the lime is a substance used to raise soil pH levels, and it is not directly related to the soil type described in the question. Question number two. The part of a flower from which fruits are formed is the blank. A. Stigma. B. Stamen. C. Ovary. D. Petals. The part of a flower from which fruits are formed is the blank. For question number two, the correct answer is C. Ovary. The ovary is the part of a flower that contains one or more ovules, which are the structures that develop into seeds after fertilization. It is located at the base of the pistil, which is the female reproductive organ of a flower. The ovary plays a vital role in fruit formation. After successful pollination, when pollen grains from the male reproductive organ, stamen, reach the stigma, a pollen tube grows down through the style and reaches the ovary. Fertilization occurs within the ovary, where the male gametes, sperm, fuse with the female gametes, eggs, within the ovules. This fertilization process initiates the development of seeds within the ovules. As the seeds develop, the ovary undergoes changes and often enlarges, forming the fruit. The other options listed are different parts of the flower. A. Stigma. The stigma is the sticky, receptive tip of the pistil, where pollen grains land during pollination. B. Stamen. 
The stamen is the male reproductive part of the flower, consisting of the anther, which produces pollen, and the filament, which supports the anther. D. Petals. Petals are the colorful, often leaf-like structures of a flower that are responsible for attracting pollinators. Question number three. What does commutation typically refer to in the context of law and criminal justice? A. The reduction of a criminal sentence to a lesser punishment. B. The process of transferring a criminal case from one jurisdiction to another. C. The formal written decision issued by a court at the conclusion of a trial. D. The legal process of granting a defendant bail or pretrial release. What does commutation typically refer to in the context of law and criminal justice? For question number three, the correct answer is A. The reduction of a criminal sentence to a lesser punishment. In the context of law and criminal justice, commutation typically refers to the reduction of a criminal sentence to a lesser punishment. This can involve reducing a person's prison sentence, fine, or other penalties associated with their conviction. Commutation is often granted based on various factors such as good behavior, rehabilitation, or other compelling circumstances. Question number four. What does the term demand typically refer to in economics? A. The quantity of a good or service that producers are willing and able to provide. B. The desire or willingness of consumers to purchase a good or service at a specific price. C. The price at which the supply of a good or service equals the quantity demanded. D. The total amount of money consumers are willing and able to spend on goods and services. What does the term demand typically refer to in economics? For question number four, the correct answer is B. The desire or willingness of consumers to purchase a good or service at a specific price. In economics, the term demand typically refers to the desire or willingness of consumers to purchase a good or service at a specific price. It represents the relationship between the price of a product and the quantity of that product that consumers are willing and able to buy at that price. Demand is influenced by various factors, including price, income, preferences, and the availability of substitutes. Question number five. There is a sudden increase in the demand for a popular toy due to a viral social media trend. As a result, the toy becomes scarce and difficult to find in stores. Which of the following best describes the situation? A. Surplus. B. Shortage. C. Equilibrium. D. Elasticity. There is a sudden increase in the demand for a popular toy due to a viral social media trend. As a result, the toy becomes scarce and difficult to find in stores. Which of the following best describes the situation? For question number five, the correct answer is B. Shortage. A shortage occurs when the demand for a product exceeds its available supply. In this scenario, the sudden increase in demand for the popular toy due to a viral social media trend has caused it to become scarce and difficult to find in stores. The supply of the toy is insufficient to meet the high demand, resulting in a shortage. 
Here are brief explanations of the other options. A. Surplus. A surplus occurs when the supply of a product exceeds the demand for it. C. Equilibrium. Equilibrium refers to a state where the demand for a product matches its supply, resulting in a balance between the two. D. Elasticity. Elasticity refers to the responsiveness of demand or supply to changes in price or other factors. Question number 6. What is the law which states that volume and temperature are directly related? A. Newton's. B. Boyle's. C. Charles's. D. Motion's. What is the law which states that volume and temperature are directly related? For question number 6, the correct answer is C. Charles's law. Charles's law, also known as the law of volumes, states that the volume of a gas is directly proportional to its temperature, assuming pressure and the amount of gas remain constant. It is named after Jacques Charles, a French scientist, who formulated this gas law. According to Charles's law, as the temperature of a gas increases, its volume also increases proportionally. Similarly, as the temperature decreases, the volume decreases proportionally, as long as other factors such as pressure and the amount of gas remain constant. Question number 7. The largest family of flowering plants is the blank A. Pea family B. Rose family C. Milkweed family D. Composite family The largest family of flowering plants is the blank For question number 7 the correct answer is D. Composite family. The composite family, also known as the Asteraceae family, is the largest family of flowering plants. It is composed of a wide range of plants that include many familiar species such as sunflowers, daisies, asters, chrysanthemums, and dandelions. The family is named composite because its flowers are composed of multiple small individual flowers clustered together to form a single flower-like structure called an inflorescence. Each small individual flower within the inflorescence is called a floret. The other options mentioned are a. Pea family. The pea family, also known as Fabaceae or Leguminosae, is a large family of flowering plants that includes peas, beans, lentils, and other legume species. b. Rose family. The rose family, also known as Rosaceae, is a diverse family of flowering plants that includes roses, apples, pears, cherries, strawberries, and many other fruit-bearing and ornamental plants. c. Milkweed family. The milkweed family, also known as Aslepiadaceae or Apicinaceae, is a family of flowering plants that includes milkweeds, Aslepias, and other species known for their milky sap and unique flower structures. Question number 8. The changing of liquid molecules to vapor is known as blank. A. Condensation. B. Evaporation. C. Precipitation. D. Sublimation. The changing of liquid molecules to vapor is known as blank. For question number 8, the correct answer is B. Evaporation. Evaporation refers to the process in which liquid molecules change into vapor or gas phase. 
It occurs when the molecules at the surface of a liquid gain enough energy to overcome the intermolecular forces holding them together, allowing them to escape into the surrounding air as vapor. This process takes place at temperatures below the boiling point of the liquid. Condensation, on the other hand, is the opposite process of evaporation. It refers to the conversion of vapor or gas molecules into a liquid state when they lose energy and come together to form liquid droplets. Precipitation is a broader term that refers to any form of water, either liquid or solid, falling from the atmosphere to the Earth's surface. It includes rain, snow, sleet, and hail. Precipitation can occur when water vapor condenses into liquid droplets or ice crystals in the atmosphere and subsequently falls to the ground. Sublimation, another term mentioned, refers to the process in which a substance directly transitions from a solid to a gas without passing through the liquid phase. It bypasses the liquid state altogether. Question number 9. Clouds formed from the vertical lifting of warm air are, blank. A. Stratus. B. Nimbus. C. Cumulus. D. Cirrus. Clouds formed from the vertical lifting of warm air are, blank. For question number 9, the correct answer is C. Cumulus. Cumulus clouds are formed from the vertical lifting of warm air. These clouds have a puffy, cotton-like appearance with a well-defined shape and distinct boundaries. They often resemble heaps, towers, or cauliflower heads. When warm air rises, it cools as it ascends into higher altitudes. As the air cools, water vapor within the rising air condenses into visible water droplets or ice crystals, forming cumulus clouds. These clouds are typically associated with fair weather, especially when they are small and scattered. However, under certain conditions, cumulus clouds can grow into cumulonimbus clouds, which are associated with thunderstorms and heavy rainfall. The other options mentioned are a. Stratus Stratus clouds are low-lying clouds that appear as a uniform, featureless layer covering the sky. They often bring overcast conditions, light drizzle, or fog. b. Nimbus Nimbus is not a specific type of cloud. It is a term used to indicate that a cloud is associated with precipitation. For example, nimbostratus clouds are low-level clouds that produce steady, widespread rain or snow. d. Cirrus Cirrus clouds are high-altitude clouds that appear thin, wispy, and fibrous. They often have a feathery or filamentous appearance and are composed mainly of ice crystals. Cirrus clouds are typically associated with fair weather, but their presence can indicate an approaching weather change. Question number 10. Air pressure, wind, heat, and precipitation are the things that make up the blank. A. Weather. B. Atmosphere. C. Weight of the air. D. Moisture content in the air. Air pressure, wind, heat, and precipitation are the things that make up the blank. For question number 10, the correct answer is A. Weather. Weather refers to the atmospheric conditions that occur in a specific place over a short period of time, typically ranging from hours to days. It encompasses various elements, including air pressure, wind, heat, temperature, and precipitation. 
These factors interact and combine to create the conditions we experience in the atmosphere at a given time and location. Question number 11. If you leave cold water for several minutes, you will see droplets of water formed outside the glass. This process is called blank. A. Melting. B. Condensation. C. Evaporation. D. Precipitation. If you leave cold water for several minutes, you will see droplets of water formed outside the glass. This process is called blank. For question number 11, the correct answer is B. Condensation. Condensation is the process by which a gas or vapor changes into a liquid state. When cold water is left for several minutes, the temperature of the surrounding air cools down the water vapor in the air near the surface of the glass. As a result, the water vapor loses heat energy and transitions into liquid water droplets, which are seen as droplets forming outside the glass. This phenomenon is known as condensation. Question number 12. Which of the following is not a metal? A. Gold. B. Silver. C. Nickel. D. Iodine. Which of the following is not a metal? For question number 12, the correct answer is D. Iodine. Iodine is not a metal, it is a non-metal. It belongs to the halogen group on the periodic table and is a purple-black solid at room temperature. Gold, silver, and nickel, on the other hand, are metals. They are elements that typically have a shiny appearance, conduct electricity and heat, and are malleable and ductile. Question number 13. Diamond is made up of carbon. It is also the hardest substance known. It is considered to be a blank. A. Metal. B. Non-metal. C. Halogen. D. Metalloid. Diamond is made up of carbon. It is also the hardest substance known. It is considered to be a blank. For question number 13, the correct answer is B. Non-metal. Diamond is made up of carbon atoms arranged in a crystal lattice structure. Carbon is a non-metal element. While diamond is composed of the same element as graphite, another form of carbon, the arrangement of carbon atoms in diamond results in its exceptional hardness, making it the hardest known substance. Diamonds possess a range of desirable properties, including high thermal conductivity, low electrical conductivity, and exceptional optical properties, which make them highly valued in various industries, particularly in jewelry. Here are the definitions of the other options. A. Metal. Metals are a group of elements that typically have a shiny appearance, are good conductors of heat and electricity, and are malleable and ductile. They are found on the left side and middle of the periodic table. Examples of metals include gold, silver, iron, copper, and aluminum. C. Halogen. Halogens are a group of elements located in group 17 of the periodic table. They include fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and astatine. Halogens are highly reactive non-metals and have seven valence electrons, making them prone to forming compounds with other elements. D. Metalloid. Metalloids, also known as semi-metals, are elements that exhibit properties of both metals and non-metals. They are found along the zigzag line on the periodic table, separating the metals from the non-metals. 
Metalloids possess characteristics such as moderate electrical conductivity, varying degrees of luster, and the ability to behave as either conductors or insulators depending on the conditions. Examples of metalloids include silicon, germanium, arsenic, and antimony. Question number 14. Henry approached the platform with his speech. His palm was sweaty and his hands is shaking. He felt the palpitation of his chest and perspiration began to appear at his forehead. Henry is experiencing, blank, A. Love, B. Stage fright, C. Epilepsy, D. Heart attack. Henry approached the platform with his speech. His palm was sweaty and his hands is shaking. He felt the palpitation of his chest and perspiration began to appear at his forehead. Henry is experiencing, blank. For question number 14, the correct answer is, B. Stage fright. Based on the given description, Henry is experiencing stage fright. Stage fright, also known as performance anxiety, is a common feeling of nervousness or anxiety that people may experience when speaking or performing in front of an audience. It can manifest with physical symptoms such as sweaty palms, shaking hands, increased heart rate, palpitations, and sweating. These physical reactions are often associated with the anxiety and stress of being in the spotlight or facing a public speaking situation. Question number 15. Insulin deficiency or resistance of the pancreas leads to blank. A. Brain tumor. B. Diabetes mellitus. C. Hypertension. D. Leukemia. Insulin deficiency or resistance of the pancreas leads to blank. For question number 15, the correct answer is B. Diabetes mellitus. Insulin deficiency or resistance of the pancreas is associated with the development of diabetes mellitus. Diabetes mellitus is a chronic metabolic disorder characterized by high blood sugar levels, hyperglycemia. Insulin is a hormone produced by the pancreas that regulates the absorption and utilization of glucose, sugar, in the body. In cases of insulin deficiency, type 1 diabetes, or resistance, type 2 diabetes, the body's ability to properly regulate blood sugar levels is impaired, leading to elevated levels of glucose in the bloodstream. This condition can have various health consequences and requires proper management and treatment. Remember, dear teachers, that passing your board exam is not about getting it right on the first try. It's about resilience, determination, and perseverance. Like Thomas Edison, who didn't give up after 10,000 failed attempts, you too can learn from every mistake and move closer to success. Every time you take a practice test, every time you study a new concept, every time you overcome a challenge, you're one step closer to achieving your goal. Don't be discouraged by setbacks or failures. Instead, view them as opportunities to learn, grow, and improve. You have the knowledge, skills, and passion to succeed. Believe in yourself, keep going, and before you know it, you'll be celebrating your hard-earned success as a licensed and accomplished teacher. Question number 16. Tropical disturbances are classified as tropical depression, tropical storm, or typhoon. This classification is based on the blank A. Amount of rainfall B. Strength of the accompanying winds C. Origin of formation D. Amount of rainfall and strength of the accompanying winds Question number 16. Tropical disturbances are classified as tropical depression, tropical storm, or typhoon. This classification is based on the blank. For question number 16, the correct answer is B. Strength of the accompanying winds. According to Pegasa the strength of the accompanying winds is the primary indicator for classifying tropical disturbances. This stands for the Philippine Atmospheric, Geophysical and Astronomical Services Administration. It is the National Meteorological and Hydrological Organization in the Philippines. It is responsible for monitoring and providing weather forecasts, climate information, and other meteorological services for the country.
Question number 17. The amount of matter in an object is called blank. A. Density. B. Mass. C. Volume. D. Space. The amount of matter in an object is called blank. For question number 17, the correct answer is B. Mass. The amount of matter in an object is referred to as its mass. Mass is a fundamental property of matter and represents the quantity of material present in an object. It is commonly measured in units such as grams, g, or kilograms, kilogram. The mass of an object remains constant regardless of its location in the universe and is independent of external factors such as gravity or the presence of other objects. Density, option A, is a property that relates the mass of an object to its volume. Volume, option C, is the measure of the amount of space occupied by an object. Space, option D, generally refers to the vast expanse that contains all matter and energy in the universe. Question number 18. Which of the following statements is true regarding recessive genes? A. Recessive genes are always expressed in the phenotype. B. Recessive genes are more common in the population than dominant genes. C. Recessive genes require two copies to be expressed in the phenotype. D. Recessive genes are always inherited from the father. Which of the following statements is true regarding recessive genes? For question number 18, the correct answer is C. Recessive genes require two copies to be expressed in the phenotype. Recessive genes are those that are masked or not expressed in the phenotype when an individual carries one dominant allele alongside the recessive allele. To exhibit the recessive trait in the phenotype, an individual must inherit two copies of the recessive allele, one from each parent. This is known as being homozygous recessive. In contrast, individuals who are heterozygous, having one dominant and one recessive allele, typically exhibit the dominant trait in their phenotype. Question number 19. A life unexamined is not worth living, is a famous dictum supposedly uttered by, blank. A. Aristotle. B. Darwin. C. Plato. D. Socrates. A life unexamined is not worth living, is a famous dictum supposedly uttered by, blank. For question number 19, the correct answer is, D. Socrates. The quote, a life unexamined is not worth living, is attributed to the ancient Greek philosopher Socrates. Socrates is known for his philosophical teachings in the Socratic method, which involved questioning and examining beliefs and ideas to arrive at a deeper understanding. This particular dictum reflects Socrates' emphasis on the importance of self-reflection, introspection, and the pursuit of wisdom and knowledge. It is often considered a foundational concept in Western philosophy. Question number 20. Zebra, horse and donkey have similar characteristics because they belong to the same, blank. A. Genus. B. Rank. C. Species. D. Taxonomy. Zebra, horse and donkey have similar characteristics because they belong to the same, blank. For question number 20, the correct answer is, A. Genus. Zebra, horse, and donkey belong to the same genus, which is Equus. They are closely related species within the Equidae family. While they have distinct characteristics and variations, they share common traits due to their close evolutionary relationship and shared ancestry. The genus classification groups together species that are closely related and share similar characteristics. In this case, zebra, horse, and donkey share enough similarities to be classified under the same genus, Equus. Question number 21. Which of the following statements best describes the divine rights theory? A. It is a political theory that asserts the power of the government comes from the consent of the governed. B. 
It is a philosophical concept that promotes the idea of natural rights and individual freedoms. C. It is a religious doctrine that claims rulers derive their authority directly from a higher power. D. It is an economic theory that advocates for free market principles and limited government intervention. Which of the following statements best describes the divine rights theory? For question number 21, the correct answer is C. It is a religious doctrine that claims rulers derive their authority directly from a higher power. The divine rights theory is a religious doctrine that claims rulers derive their authority directly from a higher power. According to this theory, monarchs and rulers are believed to be appointed by God or have a divine mandate to govern. They are considered to have absolute authority and are accountable only to God, not to the people they govern. Question number 22. Which of the following statements best describes the paternalistic theory? A. It is a political theory that emphasizes the importance of individual liberties and limited government interference. B. It is an economic theory that advocates for state control and ownership of the means of production. C. It is a social theory that justifies limiting individual freedom for the sake of protecting or benefiting individuals considered to be in need of guidance or protection. D. It is a legal theory that promotes the principle of equality and fairness in the justice system. Which of the following statements best describes the paternalistic theory? For question number 22, the correct answer is C. It is a social theory that justifies limiting individual freedom for the sake of protecting or benefiting individuals considered to be in need of guidance or protection. The paternalistic theory is a social theory that justifies limiting individual freedom for the sake of protecting or benefiting individuals considered to be in need of guidance or protection. It asserts that those in positions of authority, such as the government or employers, should make decisions on behalf of individuals or groups, with the belief that they know what is best for them. Term, paternalistic, can also refer to attributes associated with a father or mother figure. In a broader sense, paternalism can refer to a philosophy or practice where those in positions of authority or power make decisions for others with the intention of acting in their best interests, similar to the way a parent would make decisions for their children. Question number 23. What is the GCF of 85, 153 and 375? A. 23. B. 19. C. 17. D. 15. What is the GCF of 85, 153 and 375? For question number 23, the correct answer is C. 17. To get the GCF divided the given with the choices. Question number 24. In the example of 5 to the 10th power plus 8x the exponent is blank. A. 5. B. 10. C. 8. D. X. In the example of 5 to the 10th power, plus 8, times the exponent, we need to determine the value of the exponent. The expression can be written as 5 to the power of 10 plus 8x. The exponent in this case is 10. Therefore, the correct answer is b. 10. Question number 25. If the ratio of chickens, goats and sheep in a farm is 5 is to 1 is to 2 and there are 48 animals in all how many of them are goats? A. 2 B. 4 C. 6 D. 8 To find the number of goats on the farm, we need to determine the number of animals corresponding to the ratio of 5 is to 1, is to 2. Let's assign variables to the ratios. 
Number of chickens equals 5x. Number of goats equals 1x. Number of sheep equals 2x. Given that there are 48 animals in total, we can write the equation. 5x plus 1x plus 2x equals 48. Combining like terms, we have 8x equals 48. Dividing both sides of the equation by 8, we get x equals 6. Now, we can substitute the value of x back into the ratios to find the number of goats. Number of goats equals 1x equals 1 times 6 equals 6. Therefore, there are 6 goats on the farm, option C. Thank you for watching Geo's lead review. I hope they've been helpful in your exam preparation. Remember that success in the lead requires consistency and dedication, so I encourage you to come back for more videos to help you stay on track with your studies. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications so you don't miss any new videos. My goal is to provide you with high quality content that helps you feel confident and prepared for the exam. So, let's work together towards your success in the lead. Keep studying hard and I'll see you in the next video.